very much. So it's good to see this soggy morning. So I guess we'll be the soggy bottom boys. <laughs> good soggy morning. Well, it's good to be here in the house of the Lord today on, well, I guess it's the 12th of February, 2023. We're going to get down to the last two lessons in the doctrine of imputations and in particular uh, the eternal imputations, the blessings and the input that God will have uh, into us, uh, with us and for us uh, when our time of uh, our rewards are doled out at the Bema Seat of Christ. And so I'm going to go ahead and ask you to, to turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Uh, this lesson is entitled uh, Traits of Crown Recipients. But I also, had, I think it's on the label for the uh, for the uh, CDs that we do, uh, preview to the Watchman's Wreath, which will be uh, Wednesday night, the Watchman's Wreath. Uh, that'll be the last of the wreaths. Be a couple lessons to go with that, but that will be it. The Watchman's Wreath will be, this is kind of like a preview to that. It's kind of like wrapping up between the, the wreaths and or the crowns. And, uh, but there are traits that we have picked up on that identify those who can expect a crown. We can expect it. Uh, I believe the Bible. And I'm a, basically, when it comes to the Bible, I understand there are parts of speech, there are, there are types of speech that are in the Bible, but there are also... I mean, there are uh, figures of speech, but most of it, we look at the Bible, we interpret the Bible literally. We, when my parents used to give me instructions, I took their instructions literally. So there was no um, loss of lack of information for what I needed to know because I was being held accountable for it. So God held me accountable and our, my parents held me accountable for what they told me to do. And I believe our Father in Heaven is the consummate, wonderful parent who doesn't want us to be in the dark as his children. He just he wants all to be saved as far as that goes. He's made that very clear to humanity, that man humanity is lost and needs to be saved. But God wants us to know how to live and what to expect. But as I read some commentary this past week, from uh, a gentleman, C.I. Schofield, in regards to the crowns, and also from uh, Lewis Berry Schaefer's systematic theology, also in dealing with that, that the crowns are God's incentive program for us to behave. He gives us an incentive program because he knows we are children. We like to like, let all like, you know, we've got six letters behind our names, where, you know, all kinds of degrees and stuff, or we've been saved for you know, decades, but we're still children, as Pete often says sometimes in prayer, that we're still children, and though we are, some of us, or most of us are gray-haired or no-haired children, we are still nonetheless children. I, I, I have children in their 40s. I have one still in their 30s. But they're still children to me. They'll always be my children when, if I live to be 100, that would make my oldest daughter 80. I'm 20 years older than her. That was she still to me as a child. And to God, those who accept Jesus Christ as Savior, we're still children. We get all big in the britches. He has to cut us down to size so that we will listen because we get out of hand when we don't listen. But we're still children. And we t I take his word literally. Um, there are similes that are used especially in such books as the book of Revelation because they didn't have the weapons of war then that they have now. So similes will be like such as or like as unto, but when the simile is not used, it's to be taken literally, that's what it's going to be. So I, biblically, the standard that I interpret the scripture, most people who believe the Bible take the Bible to be literal. And so when I hear God say this is going to be this way and that's going to be that way, I take it literally. Now that may seem naive and I may seem simple for doing that, 
but typically I'm not smarter than God. I think he knew how to write the Bible, how to navigate, as the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, through the work of the Holy Spirit, who is God and in spirit, how to navigate the writing of the Scripture, not just in prophecy, but in the writing of Scripture, including that of Moses and the Pentateuch, or Taurus, the Hebrews would call it, how to write what needed to be written, what needed to be done and dictated in such a way because they were not just writers, they were also dictators. They took the, they dictated what God wanted them to say in the vernacular of their day, using the background that they had to write what they wrote. And they didn't go to all this trouble to just give us a puzzle to always be trying to unlock. We're not Gnostics here. We are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we believe what the Bible says is pretty plainly there. There are times when we have to compare Scripture with Scripture because the theology cannot break the character of God in doing so for it to be something that God wants. So that's always a part of the endeavor of those of us who study, especially to teach, because there's a lot in which to be accountable for. But when I look at the Scripture, I see that there are traits of those who received the crown. As we said Wednesday night, and James 1.12, I'll just read these off to you, you know them. Blessed is the honorable believer that endures temptation. And we look at things in the context, the temptation to walk away from the faith, the temptation to not ask God for wisdom and to seek man's wisdom instead. The temptation that when you fall into various trials, as verse 2 of James 1 says, that you don't go AWOL, absent without leave, that you stick with the stuff. You don't quit the faith because your faith is being tried. That is when you lean into your faith. And for those who do that, God is working his work. Patience is being produced in that believer. Endurance is being produced, as verse 4 says. Maturity is being produced in your life. God is being honored in your life. You're not double-minded, as verse 8 of James chapter 1 says. And you're treating people the way God would have you to treat them. Well, you're, te you're tempted not to be good as a Christian. You're tempted not to trust God. You're tempted to go in your own strength. But when you don't do that and you follow God's way and his word and his strength, the Bible says there is a crown of life awaiting you so God tells you how you are to live to get the crown so if you live that way you can expect the crown you can expect it but probably the last lesson we'll do we'll share what the remuneration might look like it's not a tiara that you wear forever and then in 2nd Timothy Paul said because he had, what, fought the good fight, he had completed the course, he didn't quit because he got white-haired or no-haired, in his case probably no-haired, pointy-eyed, beady-eyed, bent over, hook-nosed, <coughs> half-blind, he didn't quit. He was going to have his head cut off. He knew that was coming. He didn't quit. He asked actually to have the parchments and the books brought to him when he was in his last imprisonment. I fought the good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. As a result thereof, or henceforth, there is awaiting me, or laid up, which means that is ahead of me, waiting for me, there is a crown of righteousness which the Lord not only going to give to me that day, but to all those who have agape love. That is learned in 1 John 2, 5 through the intake of the word of God. Then he had an expectation of the crown of righteousness. Over here in James, there's the expectation for the crown of life. We looked at 1 Peter uh, chapter 5 Wednesday. And there is a way that the pastor can have an expectation of the crown of glory. By feeding the flock of God. Taking the oversight of it. Not because you have to, but you do it willingly. Not that you've got money on the brain, but you're doing it of a ready mind. You're not clouded in your reason for your motivations for serving. 
You're not lords over God's heritage. You don't treat them like red-headed stepchildren. You respect them. You try to be an example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall, no element of doubt, indicative mood. And every one of these is in the indicative mood, which means no element of doubt. If you do these things, this is what you will receive. If you don't do these things, also the indicative mood applies, but you won't get these crowns. So I believe that there are traits for those of us, hopefully all of us. I believe, as I said several times, that God is an equal opportunity God and Savior. And uh, if you want to call him employee, employer, and we need to be an employee or a master, and we are his servants, and you know, there's, there's a lot of analogies you can look at there, shepherd and sheep and such and so forth. That every believer has the opportunity to receive the crown. Every believer does. It's what they choose to do with their life. This is why I get upset with churches that distract believers from maturity and growth in the things of God and put on a show for an hour. Have a lot of things, bells and whistles going on that are attractive. It's like drawing magpies to a tin pan. That doesn't qualify believers to be ready to go through what it takes to qualify for these crowns which have eternal ramifications. So I think when pastors don't understand their responsibility of feeding the flock that they put their flock's eternal uh, blessings uh, in, in, a, in jeopardy. And there's obviously the culpability that goes with those folks, obviously, when they get the opportunity to come out from that. But like, once you're addicted to hopped up music, once you're addicted to a busy bee, buzzy, buzzy, buzzy type congregation type thing, coming into a study of the Word of God and fellowshipping and worshiping in a style that we worship in is anticlimactic. So, you know, where you can drown Jesus out all you want, but the word is where we really need the help here. So, in this study, uh, traits of crown recipients, I want us to look at some of these things. We've kind of outlined them just now. But I, I see two. One of them is a willingness to undergo undeserved suffering, and the other is a genuine agape love for God. A willingness to undergo undeserved suffering and secondly, a genuine agape love resonating in the soul. We'll look at these two points and break them down. So, so far we looked at three different wreaths awarded at the judgment seat of Christ, crown of righteousness, crown of life, and the crown of glory. Again, I said the next one will be the watchman's wreath. But in the last several weeks, we've covered those three different wreaths awarded at the judgment seat of Christ. Two important qualifications seem to come out of those studies, of those three different wreaths. Two in particular, willingness to suffer and a genuine, unconditional love for God. In other words, we didn't quit on God just because he became inconvenient or we weren't amused with our life. I think too many Christians quit... Uh, sound teaching because something else amuses you mean the word amuse means not to think muse means to chew on something to think on something amusement means not to think that's why they call amusement parks amusement parks don't worry about that thing falling apart just get on the roller coaster don't worry about the ferris wheel getting stuck and lightning hitting the top of it just get on and have fun don't worry about the tilt of world and you get slung out down into the creek somewhere, just get on because it looks like fun. Your brain will love it for a few seconds. The people around you won't when you lose your cookies. <laughs> I've seen that happen in Buchanan at the festival two years ago. And that thing that goes way up in the air, somebody lost their cookies on the way down. Hello. Mm -hmm. and, all right. This is what we're going to look at here. A willingness to undergo undeserved suffering. Father, we ask as we look in your word this morning that you will bless our understanding, help us to see things that are be a benefit to us as we try to serve uh, you and we try to understand you. 
we thank you that we can serve you and we can understand you uh, whatever limited amount it might be we know father it'd be subject to our dedication and our staying a dedication to the word and our staying in fellowship with you under your power thank you now for all the those who've come out pray for those that couldn't make it today thank you now for this time of study in christ's name amen Let me just read this passage and then we'll get with this study. Hebrews 13, 7 says, Remember them who have uh, the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose the faith follow, considering the end or the consummation of their conduct of life. Remember, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then it says in verse 9, Be not carried about with various multifaceted divers and strange doctrines or strange teachings for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace not with meat established with grace not with foods which have not profited them that have been occupied with them doctrine feeds the soul like food feeds the body and then it says we have an altar of which they have no right to eat that's a spiritual altar who serve the tabernacle they're not saved so unsaved people can't learn the word of God so there's a separation of Christian worship from those who worship apart from Christian doctrine too many churches try to bring in non-Christian doctrine as a form of worship and the Bible is saying here that we have our own altar of service in worshiping God it's not the same as those who are not believers in Christ for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin they are burned outside the camp therefore Jesus also that he might sanctify or set apart the people with his own blood suffered outside the gate so let us go forth therefore unto him that is Christ outside the camp and bear his reproach see we're not like everybody else one of the failures of Christianity is that we like to be like everybody else and we feel like we're outsiders when we don't when really if they're not following the doctrine of how to worship God they are the ones on the outside I can assure you that the people on the outside of the ark were a lot louder than the ones on the inside For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving up thanks to his name. But to do good and to share, forget not, for which such sacrifices God is well pleased. Stick with service unto the Lord before ritual. Then he says, Obey them that have the Heget Omai, the rule over you, Submit yourselves, for they watch for your soul. There is a watchman's reef, but this also is a joint reef because we help one another as far as that goes. But in this case, there's still there's the watchman's reef, as some call it. For they watch for your souls, as they must give account. A lot of people think that when you die, you know, you wait as a Christian, you go to heaven. Your work's over other than the fact that you have, you know, given report of your life before the Lord for your rewards. That time will come. There will be an answer question time just with the Lord one-on-one. -on -one. But when a pastor dies, his job is not done yet. He's still got work to do. He still can get called up to the Bema seat as a witness right there. They watch for your soul. This is spiritual leadership. They watch for your souls as they that must give account. That they may do it, that is give account with joy and not with grief. That's a chain of command, folks. For that is unprofitable to you. 
And so we'll get to that. That's that's part of the watchman's wreath. But this here kind of, I wanted to, that was planned on being my sermon today. But when I got to working on this, it kind of stretched between the last one and that one. <laughs> so anyway, number one, two qualifications were found to be connected to the recipients of the crown. Willingness to suffer, agape love for God. Number one, this believer who is willing to suffer for Christ does not fail God in the midst of their trials and temptations. And we all go through them. We all get a case of give up itis at times. These believers do not allow prosperity to sidetrack their faithfulness to the Lord, and they do not allow their adversity to impede or sidetrack their faithfulness to the Lord. They do not allow that to happen either publicly or privately. See, there are people who serve the Lord publicly, but privately, eh, no, it's not so good. And eventually, that worms its way out. You know, the Bible says our sins will find us out. If we, our heart is somewhere else, it eventually our feet will follow. It's just a matter of time. And so we need to be careful of that. All of us do, preachers especially. 2 Timothy 4.10, Paul had said, after he had talked about how to win the crown of righteousness, he said to Timothy, do your diligence to come shortly unto me. But he said, as far as Demas is concerned, 2 Timothy 4.10, well, Demas had forsaken him, though he had served with him earlier in his missionary journey. He had forsaken him at the end. He'd given up on serving in the ministry to the one that God had called him to because he loved this present world. He loved this, having loved this present world. And he's departed unto Thessalonica. So he left. He loved this present, and the word world is cosmic system or cosmos there. He loved the world, whatever it might have involved, whether it was materialism, fame, being liked, being favored, whatever it was, he didn't does he didn't earn the crown. And I don't believe that Paul would have had him with him as long as far as he took him had he not been a believer in Jesus Christ. But a lot of believers have forsaken the things of God because they have loved they love this present world. Not going to get a crown for love in this present world. So what we have to be careful of is not to become distracted. That takes discipline, but it also takes patience with God. I'll put it this way. When God has to correct us of our sins, we can use 1 John 1 on, and we should. We need to use it when it's necessary. We, we've been in even more trouble if we don't. Confession to God of our sins. That's a private thing between you and the Lord. But when we don't and we become callous to what we're doing and we're thinking, I don't want to think that that's wrong anymore, eventually it becomes a pattern and what happens is when you finally start to recover from that when god removes that scar tissue he uses a scalpel to cut that thing open and get that pus and that scab and all that mess off of there when he does he throws the salt of the word of god on it and you say ouch that hurts you stepped on my toes you did more than that you beat me up and you didn't even realize it but the truth of the matter is that's the only way god can get healing begun but it takes a while before you start feeling normal again. And some Christians, they give up because they don't feel like they're all friendly with God again. When God says, look, I'm going to keep you at arm's length. I don't trust you yet. Now, God knows in his omniscience when it will be when they will be trustworthy. It may be they will never be trustworthy again. Their propensity to be selfish and to do whatever it is that they want to do, however they may justify it, will never change. They'll live perpetually in the brig as far as God is concerned, but they're saved. And then there are the believer that just eats up and gobbles up the word of God and loves it, and they're the ones that we like to follow. They're the ones that are a bright light in our lives. Whether they've been saved a short time or a long time, they're still they're positive and they they shine like a bright light this believer doesn't grow weary of the routine of everyday life the mature believer who earns the crown 
does not grow weary of the routine of everyday life. The mature believer does not live for the spectacular. They live for the Lord. Now, a lot of these you've got in your notes because this is one of the few sermons that I've had in some time that I only had one page of notes with it. Because like I say, it was too long to finish on the last one, and it was too much to add to the next one. <laughs> so it's kind of like a parenthetical message. Something in between. It's a tweener. The believer who is willing to undergo undeserved suffering and will earn a crown, or crowns, plural, this believer takes ridicule from those who attack their stand for the Lord, whether that ridicule comes from a believer or a non-believer. The mature believer knows he's not perfect or she's not perfect. They know they have a long way to go to fully understanding God, and so they continue to search the Scriptures in the Word. They keep on diligently searching the Scriptures. Proverbs 8, 17, I love those who love me, and those who seek me early shall find me. And then Hebrews eleven six that we believe that God is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We believe the Scriptures. And so we do as the scriptures say. If we're simple-minded church folk for doing that, then I wear that as a moniker uh, of, of glory, not shame. There are some Christians who would lead you to believe that you are shameful if you don't rock with the roll. Truth is built on truth, and it has to be learned. The human spirit, the new man, I will you and I need to understand this, is that the human spirit cannot receive false doctrine. It cannot receive error. The Holy Spirit resides there, and greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He that is in the world is trying to get false doctrine into your human spirit that will inspire your soul. But the Holy Spirit resides with the human spirit. His spirit bears witness with your spirit. And as his spirit bears witness with your spirit and teaches you, 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 14, 1 John 2 and verse 27, as his spirit teaches you and I as God's children, when something that is false tries to enter in, the Holy Spirit present, resents it, cannot let it in because the human spirit is isolated and insulated by the Holy Spirit. And I've said this before, that the Holy Spirit not only seals us into the body of Christ he seals himself in there with us yes he's omnipresent but the spirit being omnipresent doesn't have a problem with being in you and you and you is the same anywhere in the world but he doesn't only seal you inside the body of Christ he's sealed inside of you until the day of redemption that is until you get your bodily resurrection and no old sin nature to compete with God's spirit anymore but the human spirit which is another word for the new man, does not receive false teaching or error because the Holy Spirit lives there, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4. <coughs> this is why the Bible is learned and perceived line upon line and precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. Isaiah 28, 9 through 10. Because we can only comprehend so much at a time. Comprende? <laughs> the more you know, I've said this before, the more you glow. I know that's simplified, but at least the more you know, the more you can grow. The more I know, the more I can grow. I can't graduate to the fourth grade until I've passed the third. I can't graduate from high school until I've gone through the high school grades. The more I know, the more I grow, the more I know. The more I know, the more I grow. And I'm talking about not just from an academic perspective, which that's where it starts. It has to start there. It has to start academic. A lot of true people don't, they get bored in a church when they start being challenged academically. Well, 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3 and verse 18. And the word grow is a present. Passive, imperative, that's a command, it's a verb, we receive the knowledge, G-I-G, 
N-O-S-S-I-S. Gnosis. Academic. Epinosis. Epinosis is spiritual knowledge. It starts as academic and then it goes to spiritual. It starts in the mind. You got to be a thinker and then it goes to the heart, which is where the conscience is. Get this stuff half of that right. That's with the heart, the conscience. This is our standards of right or wrong. This is where God takes his truth and transfers it. If we'll receive it on positive volition, we are accept it by faith. It starts as gnosis, but it becomes E-P-I-G-N-O-S-I-S. And there's other words. That's a prefix preposition means above and beyond. But God teaches us the word, and as we grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, it starts academically, and then it grows spiritually. The more you know, the more you can grow. The less we know, the more likely we are to get into trouble and to be deceived or to stay into trouble and to stay deceived. The maturing believer strives to imitate Jesus Christ, and they have a spirit of humility where they can unlearn error and learn truth. Some believers can never have, they never seem to let go of falsehoods. They just can't let it go, and they feel guilty if they do let it go. That's how some churches and even cults keep control of their people, is that they make them feel guilty for going against something. Well, the Bible says that we're going to live, and James chapter 1 says that the truth gives you liberty, not bondage, liberty. We studied that in James back in the many moons ago, back in the day. Whosoever looks or lives inside the mature law of liberty or freedom, can, who continues in it, being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Blessed. So the mature believer strives to imitate Jesus Christ first in thought and then in deed. Philippians 2 5, let this mind be in you which is also in Christ. Jesus, Philippians 2, 5. So this believer puts the needs of others above their own needs, as did our Lord. He put the needs of others. That's what you have there if you'll just jot down Philippians 2 and verse 3 where it says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man just on his own things, but also on the things of others. That is, the others, the, the problems that others are going through. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So you put the needs of others above your own, as our Lord did. You're bound to be successful if you're not selfish. I'm bound to be successful if I'm not selfish. That means I cannot have my feelings easily hurt have to suck it up and do the right thing acknowledge it some people just can't be taught that's unfortunate and often preachers are the worst ones I've heard so they say <laughs> but the mature believer is not stingy with their time they're not stingy with their talents or their grace gifts or their giving this believer wants to see the local church grow spiritually, so they do everything they can to foster peace and interest in Jesus Christ and fellowship. You do what you can. It, it, it's just a drawing. It's like Jesus is the hub of the wheel and the old, the old wagon wheel, and your interest, you know, in that orbit or that circle, that outside ring, your interest, it just in so many ways, as variegated as it might be, are centered on Jesus Christ. Your life, your time, your fellowships, your interests, your study, even your hobbies, your talents, whatever. It's in Jesus Christ. This believer wants their church 
not just to grow spiritually, but they also want their church to grow in members as well, knowing that the future of the continuation of the teaching of the word, if you want it to continue, you will need others who will carry on the work after you're gone for that generation. That's my desire to see more come along who have a desire for the word, who will get here for the word, who maybe one day will fill this pulpit or other, someone outside of here will one day fill this pulpit and continue with the word. That's what this church is known for and always has been known for, for the most part. So that the influence of the salt of the word will not only save this nation, but will bring glory to God in the process of time until it's time no more. This believer wants their church to grow in members because they know that the future and existence of doctrinal churches lies in new members who are doctrinal members, not show or performance members or just following tradition members. That doesn't fly. This believer has the indispensable virtue of genuine humility. Genuine humility. And they truly love other believers in a sense of integrity they have no hidden agenda they have no secret agenda here's where we see the second important qualification connected to becoming a recipient of the crowns and that is this believer has a genuine agape love for the Lord in their soul that's where our first Peter chapter 1 and verse 8 verse came in as we had last time that you have a love for God, whom having not seen, you agape. First Peter 1, 8, whom having not seen, because if we're going through manifold trials as well, just like James 1 talks about, and Peter and James's writings are very similar. They're years apart, but they're very similar. I think Peter had a great respect for James. Whom having not seen, you love, and whom... Though you, now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. So you have a genuine love resonating in your soul. You're not just willing to undergo suffering. There's a reason for that too. You have this genuine love. This faithfulness to God pays large dividends, spiritual dividends, when it comes to trusting God during a time of trial and suffering. When the going gets tough or the temptation to get to leave for prosperous reasons, whatever, or distractions come in, whatever happens, when our temptation is too overwhelming, this believer keeps on remaining faithful to the promises of God. This virtue love that you have for God upholds you when God is testing you. And it keeps you faithful to God when you you are also being solicited by the personal attractions of this world. 1 John 2, 15 through 17 tells us that you know, those are not indicative of the Christian life. You know, 1 John 2, love not the world. The word there, love, is also agape. Don't have an unconditional love, though you will just take accept anything. That's what that means by love not. Some people just love it. You know, if there's a filet for the world, we have a filet. I like apple pie. I have a filet for apple pie. I have a filet for good, strong coffee. I have a filet for, you know, those type of things, of course. I'm just giving a little silly examples. But I don't have an agape for them. I don't, it's not unconditional. It better be good. Unconditional love, you know, if it's a, a real tart grant, uh, was it... Uh, the granny apples that are real green, you know, I wouldn't, I don't want that. I don't want a soft, mushy apple either. I like a crispy type of apple. So what I'm saying is I want a tart done. I don't want it to be too tart, and I don't want it to be mushy. So I have a filet for that. But I, if I had an agape, I wouldn't care what kind of apple went in. Well, there are some people who have an agape for the world. They don't care what it throws at them. It sticks to them. It moves them, and it's got them. He says, don't have a love for the cosmic system of the world. That is his philosophy as well. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man has this love for the world, then the love of the Father is not in him. 
For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passes away. So this virtue love that you have for God that helps qualify you for the crown is a love that trusts God regardless of your testing, regardless of the temptations that come upon you and I. The mature believer also is an independent thinker. You don't have to have somebody tell you how to think because you study the scripture. You think for yourself. If you're a positive, the Holy Spirit will guide you in the right place. And it will keep you in the right place. This is important that it comes to the point to where we are strong enough to stand by the power of God on our own two feet. And that's when you're sure of yourself. Not arrogant, but you're sure of yourself that God can trust you out there in the world because you're not going to turn your back on him and somebody's not going to change your thinking, not going to change your mind. The mature believer, you've got a really stick to it of attitude. That is, as long as you're getting the truth from the word. And you can think for yourself. You trust God to help you in your thinking. You don't... 100% depend on the preacher or the Sunday school teacher or anyone else or the person who writes the commentary or whatever. I don't either. We learn to trust God. We pray about it. We look at the scripture. We compare scripture with scripture. And then we accept that it is the word of God and we go with it. We follow it. We do not trust God's word because someone says we must. We do it because we want to. We trust God because we choose to trust God. Because you know the word of God, you trust the word of God to filter what comes into your life. You trust the word of God to be a filter that catches things that are contaminants to your thinking or to your motivation or to your crown. You're not going to let something or somebody stop you in living the life that God would have called, has called you to live. You're not going to let somebody rob you of your crown. You're not going to let some Tinkerbell rob you. You're not going to let some tin pan rob you. You're not going to let five seconds of glory rob you of that. You're not going to let five minutes of lust rob you of that. You're going to stick with the stuff. Regardless, you stick with it. Or the good stuff of God. If what you see, hear, or read runs contrary to your resident doctrinal filter, then you're going to disregard it and move forward. In other words, if you know and you walk by that place that the, it smells like a sewer, then you won't take the same path every time. Metaphorically speaking, you understand that. This believer avoids the lascivious solicitations of the world. And also, in other words, if a man has a problem with lust, he doesn't live over a whorehouse. If a person has a problem with drink, he don't live over top the ABC store. If a person has a penchant for stealing, they don't live over the jewelry store. You geographically put yourself in a place of strength not a place where you're weak if I have a tendency to, to just look at donuts and get fat I don't live over top of Krispy Kreme <laughs> especially when the light's on <laughs> but the believer avoids lascivious solicitations from the world because they're out there in your face men and women all the time and you avoid also legalism and gossip, which dampens spiritual growth. He says, with Job, though they slay me, yet him will I not deny. Such believers as this will be rewarded handsomely at the judgment seat of Christ, according to the Bible. We can bank on that. That's, that's a real incentive program. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day, for your blessing, for your mercy unto us and your kindness. We ask now that you would just give us strength, open our eyes and our hearts to your service. Thank you so much for Jesus who gave his life for us on the cross. For it's in his name we pray and we give thanks. Amen.